Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Tuesday Night Live. I hope you came expecting. I did. I am expecting some good things tonight. Truth to prevail. Truth to go forth and annihilate garbage in people's lives if they're dealing with any. Truth to find out who we are in Christ so we can walk this thing out in victory. I'm chasing after victory. Well, I shouldn't say I'm chasing after it. I've already been placed in it. But I'm going to renew my mind to what I can walk in so I don't have to walk in a bunch of garbage. Welcome, everybody, to Tuesday Night Live. Got some announcements real quick. We go through this list. Exciting things. There is no campfire worship this Friday. Kids are in school. They started this, this fresh week of school and just kind of getting in a mother and father routine of doing this thing. So we'll get back to somewhat normal, so to speak. But no, the 26th, no campfire worship this Friday from 7 to 9. Just enjoy being with your kiddos that, that Friday. Or we are still have an hour of power worship. Not worship, but hour of power prayer. So our power of prayer is for an hour you come together, and here's the thing. I bet you the enemy's already been telling you, man, you can't pray in tongues for an hour. Show up, and I bet you can. <laughs> yes, you can. Before you know it, you've given an assignment by the Holy Ghost to pray out some stuff. And before you know it, is that right, Melissa? It's done 730, and you've done prayed some things out. So it's very good. Friday, 630 to 730. Church at the MHC, Sundays at 10, at 10 a.m. Got an awesome uh, phone call today from someone that lives all the way up by St. Louis. And it's funny because she goes, so she was asking some questions. She goes, so it sounds like you're a book of Acts church. I said, oh, ma'am. <laughs> they have been coming here for 29 years. I think they came here in the very beginning of their uh, honeymoon, so to speak. And they know that they're supposed to be in this area. And they've been trying churches out, spirit-filled churches and she gave a call, and I was able to talk with her, and it was awesome. It was just, it was phenomenal. She even said some stuff to me, even just uh, chatting back and forth about some stuff, and it has me in tears of some things that was going on. It was very good. So men's group for right now is canceled on Thursdays. So for those of you men that want to show up on Thursdays for right now, we're kind of taking a, a little bit of a break on some stuff. So that's being taken care of. Winter. Bible school. I think we might be looking to uh, start that a little bit before winter, like maybe fall. Here's the thing, though, guys. Um, if we do it on Tuesdays, that's fine. But we will not have an online audience. We are not doing it online like what we are for the people that could watch right now. Um, it'll either be Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we're trying to get kind of a people's heart concerning this, so somewhat a vote. Is Tuesday going to work for you? Is hey, for some of you, Tuesday would work better because it cuts you on having to use more gas money to come in another time during the week. For some people that I've talked to, they want Tuesday and Thursday because it's just more for them to get the word in. So we are going to do that. There'll be two 50-minute classes with that, maybe a 10-minute break in between. Don will teach one. I will teach one. And it's going to be foundational stuff, stuff that we learned at Rama, stuff that is very good, foundations of faith, righteousness, Christ the healer. It's going to be very, very, very good, legit Bible school material. So, again, we're looking at that either on Tuesdays or Thursdays. If you can't be here live, we will do it per video as well. But it's only going to be for those people that signed up for that class, okay? So that'll be good. Winter Summit. It's going to be good. Can you get that there's going to be 11 different speakers coming in for this? How many is there usually? I know there's not 11. Eight? Eight or nine? Eleven. Carlissa said 11. Eleven different speakers. Some of them are going to be people that have not been here that you might not have heard of yet, but I guarantee you come expecting. It will start December 28th with Helen Lowry on a Wednesday, and then it will go all the way through, and we'll finish that Sunday morning with Don here at Church at the MHC. Come expecting. Now, for those of you online that are like, okay, that's great, I want to come to that area, there are some hotels to check into. Go to Two Guys in the Bible, check that out. When you check into that hotel, tell them Two Guys in the Bible, and you get a discounted rate, okay? It's going to be good stuff. So get your plans ready. 
see what else we have here. I think for right now, that's good, my friends. That is good. For those of you online, if you ever want a text to give, it is 573-229-0820. You know, I was, I was talking to Lacey the other day and about just giving and, and, and being a part of stuff. And, you know, you take your kids, for example. When, when you have kids, one of the most important things is is to pour the very best into your kids. They will be a product of what you pour into them, either good or bad, either worldly junk or the world, or the word. Because the Bible says that when you train a child up in the way that they should go, when they get older, what? They're not going to depart from it. They're, they're not. I know I was talking to Curtis about that the other day, and one of his, then you say one of your sons said, Dad, I still remember some stuff you taught me, whether I liked it then and he's now a grown man with a family of his own. And he said that they're not going to depart from that. Well, here's the thing. Why do you give in? Why do you sow in to those children? Why? Because you believe in them. On their best days, you believe in them. On their worst day, you believe in them. Why is it any different with church? You take your time and you come here. You see what I'm saying? Sow into a child because you believe in those child and you want the best for those children. When you sow into a ministry that you believe in, just like those children give back to you, you're able to look back and you're like, my God, thank you, Father, for helping me sow into that child. You see what they're becoming. You see what they're doing. It's no different than ministry. When you sow into a ministry that you believe in, that's doing the right things, I promise you, you're going to be able to look back and you're going to be proud that you honored God in your giving, but that you gave and sowed into something into that ministry, whether it was financial, whether it was time, whether it was prayer. And I guarantee you, just like those children, you're able to step back and you're able to see the benefits of it. You're going to do the same with the ministry that you are a part of. So we're going to get into worship tonight. Again, that is 573-229-0820 for text to give. We're going to get into some worship tonight. I want you just to expect whatever you've been going through this week, whatever you've been talking to the Father about and saying, man, I need some direction, believe that it's coming your way tonight. And it doesn't even have to be in this, but it is by the Holy Ghost, and that's what we're going to believe for tonight. Amen? It's all right. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, let's stand. Let's just lift our hands to the Lord tonight. Hallelujah. Come on, let's just worship him for a little bit. He is worthy. Amen. He is worthy of our praise. Right? I was actually on my way here, and I had, we had a different song planned. Um, but I felt like God just wanted to move in a deeper way tonight. And I, I feel like sometimes it's good to drop what you have in front of you and get at the feet of Jesus. Come on. Come on, do you believe that? Hallelujah. So I want to invite you to the front to worship with us. If you don't want to, that's okay. But let's get into an intimate deep of worship tonight. Hallelujah. Because nothing else, nothing else matters above God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tell him again.
I can put in my hand will give me more than what you can give will give me more than what you can give you inhabit the praises of your people. I think you, that we don't have to ask you to come down from the heavens. You came down and you live on the inside of us. That means that you're always more than enough, that no matter what situation comes a knocking, the greater one lives on the inside of us, that we can be so aware of that power, that glory, that person of Jesus living on the inside of us that we don't even have to pay attention to what's going on in this natural world of distractions trying to pull us away and tell us how it's going to be when you already told us how it is that we can rest in the fact that the greater one lives on the inside of us the one that defeated death, hell, and the grave and poverty and lack and gave us more than enough The same God that split the seas, let them walk across dry land. The same God that fed them in the wilderness. The same God that was with them in the fiery furnace. The same God that raised Jesus Christ from the grave. That same God lives in us the god of miracles it's more than just a bracelet and a t-shirt it's reality and that god lives in us so we expect we hunger we thirst we chase after to see that god working mightily in us but through us that the world will see a real life son and daughter in action those are the superheroes not, not what Hollywood can produce, but what you produced. And I thank you that we'll see that God in action tonight through the demonstration of your word, through the word being preached, that every single need will be met tonight, that you love these people so much online and in person that you refuse to allow any of them 
to walk out untouched by the hand of the Almighty. That whatever miracle they need, it's there. That, Father, you'll never say that that, that that need is too big for you, too far out there. But that you're able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ever ask or think. You are that God, and we worship you. We take our eyes and our gaze off of the distractions, off of lack, off of will there be enough, and we put our eyes on you where they belong, for you said you would never leave us and you would never forsake us. We fix our eyes on you. You're worthy of our praise. You're faithful when we're not. You're there when we ran away. Thank you, Father, for faithfulness. Thank you for correcting us, showing us what we need to tweak so that we could see the results of Jesus. You're merciful. You're faithful. And I thank you ahead of time for what you're doing tonight to show yourself strong on the behalf of your children, to show yourself strong on the behalf of people that maybe not know you, but you said, goodness leads to change their mind about you. You're better than what you've been told. You are better than what we've heard. You are a good God, and I thank you for that. Thank you that the word's going forth tonight. You've anointed it. You've blessed it. And I think it's going to penetrate deeply and drive out everything that does not please and meet your heart. If it's sickness and disease, it's going because that's not your heart. If it's lack, it's going because that's not your heart. If it's a, a, a burdened heart, all that pain's leaving because that's not your heart. So your heart's desire for your people online and in here tonight will be met to 100% in the name of Jesus because you're that good in Jesus' name. That's some good worship right there. That's some good stuff. So my friends, I'm going to talk to you about some stuff tonight that is reality of who you are. Because how many of you guys this morning used something like, yes, I know it's pink. Do not make fun of me. This is what the wife had, so this is what we're using. This is a mirror. It's not mine, I promise. Curtis, I'd be quiet. <laughs> this is a mirror. You use this thing to get around in the mornings. For the women, it's makeup, eye stuff, cheek stuff, lip stuff, whatever all that stuff is. You use this every day. And for a lot of us, we might not like what's staring back at us. Maybe there's gray hair. Maybe there's blemishes. Whatever it is that you don't like, you trust that mirror in the mornings when you're combing your hair and you're getting around, correct? Correct? But I got some news for you, my friends. Even though you might look at something and it might show a reflection on the outside of who you are, but that's not who you are. The real you is not what you see in the mirror. And so many people identify with that every single day. They say whether they're worthy or not, whether they have what it takes based upon looking in the mirror. Maybe they're an athlete and they look in that mirror and they say, well, I can't, I can't, I can't go do this. I don't have enough muscles. I'm not big enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm not strong enough. Maybe for a woman, she's comparing herself the way the world says a woman should look, and she don't measure up to what she sees in that magazine and on TV and in the pictures based upon what she looks at in the mirror. Well, I got good news for you. That's not who you are. 
The real you is a spirit being. You possess a soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions, and you happen to live in a physical body. The moment you step out of that body, the Bible says that you're present to be with the Lord. But don't buy the lie of this, though, either. While you're on earth, that body's just going to age and get older and crepit, and you're going to eventually lie in a bed and need someone to turn, turn you a couple hours, and they're going to have to change you and feed you and wipe you and serve you and on and on and on. That's what the world says is going to happen to your physical body. Really? I guess Moses had, us, had it better than us in a different covenant. But see, if you don't understand that, then you're going to fall in line and suit with everybody else in the world that says, well, that's just a part of getting old. I've heard that so much, and it's garbage. You show me in the Word. I thought he says he renews your strength like the eagles. Where does it say when you get older? I've heard this so much. Well, it's just a part of getting old. How many times have we heard, well, this is what you have to look forward to. Uh, No, thank you. (laughs) I want to be able to go up and down stairs. I want to have good knees. I don't want hip replacement, knee replacement, and shoulder replacement. I don't want but, to, but that's not what the world operates on. And the sad thing is, is a lot of New Testament, new born-again believers buy that lie. They bought that, they, they bit down and realized that that uh, bait was uh, fake, and it had some uh, hooks in it. Take those hooks out and spit them out. That is not God's will for you. The real you is a spirit being. Now, within that spirit, my friends, contains everything that God is. Now, once you get a glimpse of who God is and what he is and what he has and that he came and lived on the inside of you, that's some really good news. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. How many of you look uh, a little bit different now since you got born again? I mean, some of us are like, "Uh uh-huh. I would love to say that before I got born again, I was five foot one. But once I got born again, I became to be at least six three. I don't know. What's a good 280? I don't know. A big beefy dude. But I didn't. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Well, how did you become a new person? What got stripped away that was old, but what got replaced that is new? It wasn't your body. And I don't know about you, but for a long time, I still thought the same. So it wasn't my mind. So what became brand new? The spirit of man became brand new. Because at one time, whether we like it or not, Satan was our daddy. We were in the kingdom of darkness. We were in hell itself. But God stepped in, made a way through the person of Jesus Christ. And if you received him, then you became a new preacher, a a new person, a new preacher. Yeah, you, you did. You became a new preacher too. You became a new person all together. Galatians 2.20. I consider myself, now this is in the distilled translation. I love this. I consider myself having died. Now stop right there. Who died? It wasn't my body. So who died? If I consider myself as having died, who died? It wasn't my mind. And it wasn't my, it wasn't my physical body. I'm still here on this earth. It says, I consider myself having died. And now I'm, in, I'm enjoying my second existence which is simply Jesus using my body. I'm going to say that one more time. I consider myself having died, and now I'm enjoying my second existence, which is simply Jesus using my body. My friends, in both of these scriptures, it talks about something becoming completely brand new. The old is dead and done away with, and now there is a brand new person that is living. Who is that person that is living? It is your born-again spirit. Your body is still the very same. But what you see in the mirror every day is not the real you. We have become very acquainted with the outside of our body, but now we must become very aware of the real us, which is the spirit man. 
And our spirits contains all of God. All of his glory lives there. All of his power, his righteousness, his rightness, his holiness. Everything that God is and everything that God has is in our spirits, which is the real us. You might not like what you see in the natural mirror, but you'll like what you see in God's mirror. Because in God's mirror, you're basically, when you look into it and you read it, it's like a superhero movie. I mean, Jesus came to show you what a real-life son and daughter can do. The dude walked on water. He multiplied food. He calmed the storms. He spoke to the winds and waves. He raised the dead. Demons and devils were cast out, and he healed the sick. And he never did any of that and said, that's what a son can do, but you're not it. He basically showed you what a son of God looks like. The only thing that's stopping us is us. See, when we get to the point where we realize God isn't holding out on us, if you step up to a person that's sick and diseased, God's not saying, whoa, 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 uh uh-uh. The evangelist will be in town two more days. Tell them about that. It says the believers. So what qualifies you to be a believer? Yes, Jesus, I believe in your word, and I believe that you died for me, and on the third day you were raised for me, and I can't do it myself, so I'm asking you to step on the inside of me and make me a new person, just like before you even finished it. You became a new person. Now, did you see that happen? No, but you believe that he honors his word, and no one could talk you out of your salvation. How do I know that? How many times has the devil tried? All the time. Jesus came to show us the real us. Jesus came to show us what a son of God looks like and what a son of God can do once united and one with God. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.24, put on the new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. That's in the NLT. Now in the Passion Translation it says, and to be transformed as you embrace the glorious Christ within as your new life. And live in union with him. For God has recreated you all over again in his perfect righteousness. You can stop right there and go home. (laughs) It says he created you in his perfect righteousness. It doesn't say he created you and you're just still a worm trying to get by. But how many people believe that and preach that? From the pulpit. Oh, you're just a sinner saved by grace. Well, are you born again? Well, yes, sir. Well, which one are you? You born again or you a sinner? Because if so, come down, we need to lay hands on you and command that spirit of schizophrenia to go back to hell where it came from. You're either born again because God lives in you, or you're a sinner. You can't be both. In the New Testament, God does not compare the new born again natured filled God man as a sinner. Some worm trying to just barely get by. It says, for God has recreated you all over again in his perfect righteousness, and now you belong to him in the realm of true holiness. That's who you are. In these scriptures, it's telling you to do this. Now, think like it. Think like it. You can be everything that God is on the inside of you in your born-again spirit. Everything that Jesus is, God made you the same in your born-again spirit. But you can stop it, the action of it, by the way that you think. How do I know that? Well, how many people are born again and then you've heard their mouth talk based upon how their soul was thinking, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Even though healing's on the inside of them, well, it's just a part of getting old. Even though healing lives on the inside of them, well, God put this on me to teach me a lesson. Huh, that's weird. What scripture? Uh, um, but, well, that's what I thought. They can't back that up. See, my friends, the real you is identical to Jesus. You're identical twins with Jesus. How's that sound? Identical to Jesus himself in every way, shape, and form. You lack absolutely nothing. You are on the same level of sonship with Jesus. So it's easy to think, well, how, did, how, how much does God love Jesus? A lot. How does he love you? In the very same way and same degree. But then our minds get in the way because we compare God's love towards Jesus as, yeah, but he never failed, and I have done it a lot. But God removed that out of the way so there wouldn't be any hindrance. You see what I'm saying? That's how much God loves us. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 through 30. Romans chapter 8, verses 29 
through 30. For he knew all about us before we were born, and he destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son. This means the son is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters. Do you get that? He is your elder brother. He is the eldest. He is your older brother. You're not step. You're not half. I mean, I have some half brothers and sisters. And we don't share on the base, both sides. It's either you have the same mama or the same daddy. You get what I'm saying? There is no half brothers and sisters with Jesus. You have the same daddy. The same DNA that was in God that got to Jesus is the same DNA that was in God that got to you. If they checked your DNA, they're going to see some stuff unusual on the inside of you that doesn't look like the person that's not born again. What's different? That divine nature of the Almighty is floating through your blood veins. It's in your red blood cells. It's in your white blood cells. Well, Nathan, that's weird. Well, that's Bible. And there's people out there that believe that stuff, and they got results. Jesus believed it. Paul believed it. Peter believed it. The disciples believed it. Why did we put ourselves in different categories? Just because we weren't there? My friends, it's God's desire when you read the Scripture, you see yourself in it, living it, doing it, breathing it. It says, this, this means the son is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like him. Having determined our destiny ahead of time, he called us to himself and transferred. If I transferred $1,000 from my account to your account, then you can go use $1,000. Why? Because the, the funds are there. If God transferred his perfect righteousness from his account to your account, that means that you are righteous. And this is what it says. It says that he transferred his perfect righteousness to everyone he called. And those who possess his perfect righteousness, he co-glorified with his son. Guys, that is good news. So if you're ever a part, if you ever go somewhere and they talk about you're a sinner saved by grace, you'll be righteous someday when you get to heaven. And the sweet by and by. No thank you, sir. Goodbye. Leave. That is anti-Christ. That's anti-Christ. That is anti-Jesus. That is anti-God's heart for you. You and Jesus are not half or stepbrothers or sisters. He has the very same daddy as you do, and you have the very same DNA. That divine nature of the Almighty living within you. You have that dynamite explosive power living within you. Basically, your life is a superhero. <laughs> it is. Rip back your shirt and show them what you got. Make sure there's another shirt underneath it. <laughs> we, because if you think about this, I don't know about you, but I love super who I love super superhero movies. My goodness, I can identify with them. They pump me up, so to speak. I, I love it. And a lot of times, I'll look for biblical stuff in those movies. Well, how do you do that, man? I, you can get some good stuff. I've watched Wonder Woman before and got some good stuff. I have. Man, there was a time to where a guy took him hostage and was going to come in and start shooting people, and he started shooting. She came across and s s slid across the floor and did that whole thing with her hands and ricocheted all of them, and that just threw the guy off. He goes, who are you? And she goes, a believer. Huh. Well, I don't know about you, but I can get some stuff out of that. See, the life within you will affect your spirit's and your body. How do I know that? What about Romans 8, 11? Romans 8, 11. Yes, God raised Jesus to life. And since God's spirit of resurrection lives in you, he will also raise your dying body to life by the same spirit that breathes life into you. My friends, if God's spirit of resurrection lives in you, then no matter what you'll face, you're coming out the victor, not the victim. So change your mind and change the way you think. You're not going into a battle destined to lose. The battle already belongs to the Lord, but he still needs you to show up. This life within you will affect your spirits and your body. Smith Wigglesworth said, in me is working a power stronger than every other power. 
The life that is in me is a thousand times bigger than I am outside. Boy, do I identify with that, my friends. (laughs) Because so many people in life, they want to tag you based upon what they see with their natural eye. Whether we like it or not, that's how they do it. People are judgy. They'll judge you before they even get to know you. A lot of times it's based upon what you look like, what you're wearing, what you drive, what you have. People do it all the time. But Smith Wigglesworth said, in me is working a power stronger than every other power. The life that is in me is a thousand times bigger than I am on the outside. Well, what's he talking about? The spirit of man. Your born-again spirit is stronger than anything in this whole entire world. Why? Because where does God live? On the inside of you. That's where he decided to make his home. He also would say that I'm a thousand times bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. See, the life within you, the spirit man is identical to Jesus himself. The life within you is a giant filled with the very life of God. John G. Lake used to say this. God lives in that man in that suit of clothes. And where that suit of clothes goes, God goes. He said, God lives in that man in that suit of clothes. And where that suit of clothes goes, God goes. The problem is, is most people, even Christians, would say that's arrogance. Well, how dare you say that? Well, they said it to Jesus. Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So should we be seeing, saying when you've seen me, you've seen the Christ? That's not arrogance. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45, 45 through 49. 1 Corinthians 15, chapter, or, yeah, chapter 15, verses 45 through 49. It says, for it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. But the last man, which is who? Who's the last Adam? Jesus. Since for the last Adam became the life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual didn't come first. The natural precedes the spiritual. Listen to this. The first man was from the dust of the earth, Adam. The second man, Jesus, is Yahweh, from the realm of heaven. The first man, made from dust, has a race of people just like him, who are also made from dust. Get this. The one sent from heaven has a race of heavenly people who are just like him. Once we carried the likeness of the man of dust, but now let us carry the likeness of the man of heaven. Where do you think that all resides and lives, my friends? Right on the inside of you. Once we realize who we are in Christ, to me, we should be walking different, talking different, thinking different, acting different. That means that no matter what is brought before you, you should never run the opposite way. Because it's simple. What would Jesus do? I mean, we used to wear the bracelets all the time. We used to say it. What would Jesus do? Well, what would Jesus do if there was a sick person standing before you? Tuck tail and run? I got to go pray about it first. I got to see God's will. (laughs) He was the will of God in action. And what did he do? He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He brought sight to the blind. See, we are a brand new race of people, God's people. We are filled with heaven itself. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 in the Passion again, it says, Now if anyone is enfolded into Christ, he has become an entirely new person. Well, who's entirely new? Because your body's the same and soul your, your soul is the same too. So ask yourself that question. What became new? What became identical to Jesus the moment that I said yes? Your spirit. That is the real you. God's will is that you live from the spirit. That your spirit man is in the driver's seat, so to speak. That your soul is in the back seat and your body's in the trunk. Because if you have it flipped, side up, flipped upside down, then your spirit man will be in the trunk. And guess who's leading and driving? Your body. And if we do everything that our body wants to do, I don't know about you, but it usually gets me in a lot of trouble. Or if my mind's not thinking in line with where it needs to be, where does it lead me? In a lot of trouble. Been there, done that. I don't want that. 
but you can uh, renew your mind, and now your mind and your spirit are in agreement, which means your body is a slave to what the spirit wants to do, not the other side around. 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, in the uh, New Living Translation, it says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Who's that new person? The old life is gone and a new life has begun. Galatians 2.20 in the Passion says, my old identity has been co-crucified with Christ and it no longer lives. Well, there's your old identity out the window. So where's your new identity going to come from? And now the essence of this new life is no longer mine. For the anointed one lives his life through me. We live in union as one. My new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God who loves me so much that he gave himself for me, dispensing his life into mine. Is there any lack in Jesus that no lack was dispensed into your life? Is there any failure in Jesus that there was no failure that got dispensed into your life from Jesus? I'll tell you what got dispensed from Jesus into your life. Perfect righteousness, perfect holiness, perfect sonship, perfect righteousness, perfect healing, perfect health. Everything that Jesus is got dispensed into your life. And now he wants you to enjoy it, but then give it away to the other people. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Now, when I read this, I want you to think, when did man become alive? In the first part of this scripture or in the second part? Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. Second part of it is, he breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils. And because of him breathing himself into man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. When did he become alive? The moment God breathed himself into that man, not when the man was formed from the dust of the earth. So here's, we're going to do some backtracking and then some fast forwarding. Here's the thing. Jesus did not come to get you to heaven. That is a byproduct of being born again. And if Satan will get you to believe that the only thing that you did when you got born again is going to heaven, then he's tricked you the whole entire time while you're on this earth. And he's satisfied with that. Because all you'll be is, my ticket's punched to go to heaven. Yes. Thank you, Jesus, for punching my ticket while everybody around you is going to hell. But it's okay. My ticket's punched. I opened the candy bar and got the golden ticket, yay for me. That's not God's will. And Satan will be okay with you living your life like that. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. For years I thought, well, that meant living forever. No, look up that word eternal life. and it mean, it, 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 In the Greek it says aeonius zoe, and I'm not into all that Greek and Hebrew and all this. I'll make it very easy for you. You get to have life the way God has it. That simple. The same life that God is enjoying right now, the same life that Jesus is enjoying right now, is the same life God wants you to enjoy. When? When you get to heaven, you're already going to enjoy it then. If there's no difference between the sinner and the saint, then why would they want to step over? There should be something radically different with the man and woman filled with God compared to the man and woman that's filled with with Satan. Are you serious? That should be a radical difference. A radical difference. It says, then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. Great. He breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. The Amplified, it says, then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath or spirit of life. And man became a living being. Doesn't the Bible say in the New Testament that there's a law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin, sickness, disease, and death? Huh, it's weird how God tied all that together. But here's the thing. Once man died in the garden, guess what? His body did not die. So how did he die that day? How did Adam die that day? 
It took 930 years for his body to figure out how to die. The moment that happened, that's when all creation went haywire. Thorns, thistles, weeds, all this stuff. You're going to work by the sweat of your brow. You're going to be a slave now. Instead of tending the, <laughs> you get what I'm saying? The only other person that had that life that Adam had in the very beginning since then was Jesus. And what did he say in John 10, 10? We've made it so hard. We've believed these lies for years. Well, I'm going to heaven. Well, thank God for that, but that's not the main focus. Jesus said the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I've come, and he did not say, I've come to get you to heaven and get you there really quickly. If that was the deal, then the moment you said, yes, Jesus, would you would have opened your eyes and you would have been gone. Beam me up, Scotty. You would have been done. But I don't know about you, but I'm still here. So are you. So what happened? Jesus said, I've come to give you life. In other words, the same life that Adam had that he done messed it up, I've come to get this same life back in you. That was Jesus' mission. 1 John 1, 4. No, I'm sorry, John 1, 4. John 1, 4, my bad. It says, in him was life, and this life was the light of men. But you're a part of that life because you're a part of the life source. So guess what? In you is life. And the life that is in you is the light of men. Why? Because you're a carrier of the person of Jesus Christ. Remember, resurrection wasn't just an event. It is a person. The very same life that was flowing in Jesus is now flowing in you. In you is life, and it's meant to be given away. Romans 6.23, it says, For sin's meager wages is death, but God's lavish gift is eternal life. Found in your union with our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. See, God's gift is not for you to live forever. How do I know that? Everybody's going to live forever. Now, where you go is determined on what decision you make while you're here on this earth. But everybody's going to live forever. Everybody. Why? Because you're still a spirit. God's gift is eternal life, which means the God kind of life, life the way Jesus has it. This life flowed from his spirit into his body. Now, this is where it gets interesting. So many people put Jesus in a category all by himself, and, and they give the excuse, but that was Jesus. Well, we're going to find out what Jesus did is the same thing that later on Paul did and Peter did and so on. Sometimes we don't see it like this, but listen. Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, verses 25 through 30. Now in the crowd that day there was a woman who had suffered horribly from continual bleeding for 12 years. She had endured a great deal under the care of various doctors, yet in spite of spending all that she had on their treatments, she was getting worse instead of better. When she heard about Jesus' healing power, she had to hear what Jesus was doing in other towns and other villages. I like to think that she's already heard. And she's sitting here, she's dealt with this for 12 long years. Kind of makes me wonder if she heard the stories of the man with leprosy being healed. Remember how we talked about this last Sunday? It's easy to think, well, just the man that had leprosy was the only one that got touched. Well, what about the family that he's now allowed to go back to? And what about the other people that were dealing with leprosy that were a part of his community because he had to be estranged from his family? Don't you think that they were, well, why did John not come back? Oh, my God. And they see John with everything attached now because a miracle had happened. And he tells them about Jesus. You don't think those lepers didn't get a, try to get a hold of Jesus? I guarantee you they did. You have Jesus come in and clear out a cancer ward and leave about five of them left. You think that they're going to be like, oh, it's okay. I'm okay with radiation. They're going to go find Jesus. They are. She had suffered 12 long years. She had endured a great deal under the care of various doctors, yet in spite of spending all that she had on the treatment, she was getting worse instead of better. When she had heard about Jesus' healing power, she pushed through the crowd and came up from behind him and touched his prayer shawl. For she kept saying to herself, if I could touch even his clothes... I know I will be healed. As soon as her hand touched him, her bleeding immediately stopped. She knew it, for she could feel in her body instantly being healed of her disease. Jesus knew at once that someone had touched him. How? 
How? Was it just the tug of the shirt? Did it pull him backwards? No. Listen to what happened. For he felt the power that always surged around him had passed through him for someone to be healed. The life that was in Jesus' spirit was to the point that it got out into his body that his clothes were touching. Are you serious? This is better than what we've made it out to be. He turned and spoke to the crowd saying, who touched my clothes? See, this life was flowing out of Jesus' spirit and got out into his flesh. The woman touched his clothes that was touching his flesh and was made whole. He felt power surge out from him. That, my friends, was the very life of God. That life of God is in your spirit, man. That is the real you. This is not the real you of what you see in the mirror. I don't care. There's two sides of this mirror, one that shows it like that and the other one that magnifies it. I don't care how much magnifying you're doing. You ain't seeing the real you. There's not a scalpel and there's not a skilled surgeon that is skilled enough to cut you open and see the real you. Why? Because it is the spirit of man. That is the real you. That was the life of God in Jesus. This very same life is now flowing within you, and it's in your spirit, which is the real you. See, look in the word, and when you see Jesus, you need to start seeing yourself. When he was healing the sick, casting out demons, raising the dead, walking on water, speaking to storms, see yourself that way. Jesus was showing what was possible for a man that that was now united with God. Did Jesus not say that? It's not me, it's the Father in me. He does the works. He saw who was in him. We need to be doing the very same. John chapter 15, verse 5. John 15, verse 5. Now, when I say this, I want you to think, how many of you guys have a tree in your front yard or backyard? You're aware of that tree. I want you to think of that tree. John chapter 15, verse 5. I am the sprouting vine, and you're my branches. As you live in union with me and as your source, fruitfulness will stream from within you. But when you live separated from me, you are powerless. My friends, those branches don't have to try to produce fruit. All they got to do is just stay in life union with the tree. There is no difference between the vine and the branches. They're connected to the same source. The same life that is in the branch is the same life that's in the tree and vice versa. See, the very same life that is flowing in the the vine is flowing in the branches. The branches get its life from the vine. They are united together as one. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. But the one who adjoins himself to the Lord is mingled into one spirit with him. Guys, all you got to do is just remain in life union with him. Stay where you are. See, your spirit and Jesus' spirit are now one. This is the real you, not your body or what you see in the mirror. When we look into the mirror from now on, we need to start seeing Jesus staring right back at us. See, you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. The new person is not the body or the soul. It is the spirit of man that got born again. Our souls or minds need to be renewed to think and operate according to who you are in the spirit. And your body's kept under obedience to the Spirit and the Word of God. Now listen, Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. Luke 6, verses 17 through 19. Jesus and his apostles came down from the hillside to a level field where a large number of his disciples waited along with a massive crowd, people from all over Judea, Jerusalem, and the, co- uh, the coastal district of Tyre and Sidon, they came to come, they all had come to listen to the word so that they could be healed of their diseases and to be set free from tormenting demonic powers. Listen to this. The entire crowd eagerly tried to come near to Jesus to touch him to receive healing. Why would you touch something? transfer they had to have heard of something maybe it was the woman with the issue of blood 
They heard of something that was so good about Jesus that I don't, need, I don't even have to wait for Jesus to have a healing line. I'm just going to go touch Jesus and get it myself. I don't have to wait for Friday's crusade. It's Tuesday, and i got to get what's mine. I'm going to go find Jesus, and I'm going to go touch him. They touched him. They sought to touch him to receive healing. Listen to this, though. It says, because a tangible, supernatural power emanated from him and healed all who came close to him. My friends, I'm telling you, you need to start seeing yourself that same way because that is God's heart for you. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how many times you've done it. If you're born again, that life is uh, emanating from you. It is pouring and coming out through your pores. Did you ever see and read about Jesus being sick? Ever? Because he laid his deity down. He was subject to it at any time he could have. Was he? Ever? Did he ever have a runny nose? Did he ever deal with allergies? Did he ever have a fever? Did he ever have anything no, because he let that life of God in his spirit affect his body, but it flowed through him to affect other people's bodies to the point to where news was getting out and they just came and got what was theirs. I need some healing. I'm going to go find where Jesus is. But isn't it funny that Jesus later on and said, it's very important that I leave and go away. They didn't understand that. They didn't understand that. And the Bible talks about if Satan would have only known what he was doing. Because what happens when you put a seed in the ground? Hmm? It produces a huge harvest. Jesus said, oh, it's better. It's beneficial that I leave. In other words, he was saying this. Listen, there's only one of me. But if I leave, there's going to be a whole lot of me. Getting the same results, doing the same thing. Again, my friends, here is Jesus having power come out from him to heal the sick. He was very much aware and conscious of what was in him and flowing from him. This power flowing out of his spirit into his body affected him and the people receiving it. But it doesn't stop right there. What about Acts chapter 19, verses 11 through 12? What about Paul? God kept releasing a flow of extraordinary miracles through the hands of Paul. Because of this, people took Paul's handkerchiefs and articles of clothing, even pieces of cloth that had touched his skin, laying them on bodies of the sick and diseases and demons left, and they were all healed. So now they're doing it with Paul? Well, what was so special about Paul? Well, but I meant he, he, was, he, he was Paul. When's the last time you had Christians killed? If God can use Paul, God can use you. <laughs> Quit putting people in categories that for some reason you believe the lie that you don't fit into. Jesus is your mold. John G. Lake, Smith Wigglesworth, Catherine Coleman, all the R.W. Sean. Thank you, man. That story the other day that you shared Sunday got me wrecked. So if you want to, you can put all these people, but that was in the Bible. What about the story that he read? What about that? You can't tell me that God, well, that's too big. 26 diseases. I've heard that story before. I'm talking about bones cracking and popping to where you're like, like you're, yeah. But here's the thing. If God did it then, why? what makes us think he wouldn't do it now? Because my Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. People's minds and hearts have. God never has. All he needs is someone to believe and to trust him. So this happened with Acts. It happened in the book of Acts with Paul. Well, what about Peter? It says, in fact, when Peter, this is Acts chapter 5, verses 15 through 16. In fact, when people knew that Peter was going to walk by, they carried the sick out to the streets and laid them down on cots and mats, knowing the incredible power emanating from him would overshadow them and heal them. Great numbers of people swarmed in Jerusalem from the nearby villages. They brought with them the sick and those troubled by demons, and everyone was healed. Guys, I'm telling you, we believe about it in this house, because how many of you were here, or at least heard of people coming down when uh, Pastor David Craig was here, and they were cutting off articles of his shirt? What about the, the T-shirt that's back there in Don's podcast room? And it's a cut-up T-shirt because people were going and cutting up people. He said, it's a brand-new shirt. He goes, I, I just bought it. 
<laughs> they're going. The people knew the life that was in Don Allen, the life that was in David Craig. Why? Because Jesus lives in them. Can they say the same about us? They ought to be. They ought to be. They ought to be searching just to touch us. How, who says you just can't go walk by Walmart and not even say anything and just touch someone? Act like you're trying to get around on that person in a wheelchair and just put your hand on them and go, excuse me, ma'am, I hope you have a good day. What are we expecting? Because what you will expect, you'll allow to flow out of your spirit because your mind needs to be in agreement. If it doesn't, it'll damn everything up. Our minds better be on track with what it is. How do I, I mean, that Paul, uh, Paul, not compared Don to Paul. It's probably, that's some good news to be in right there. That's a good crowd. What did Don say Sunday? He goes, you better ask if God's the conductor of this or somebody else is. If God's the conductor of that train through those thoughts, I'll get on. If not, keep going. Well, who's the conductor of those thoughts that's coming through your mind? Because if you believe one is and you get on that train, you're going to stop some stuff. Even though it's in your spirit the whole time, your mind needs to be in agreement. I mean, I go back to this story all the time. It just, it, it, it just boggles my mind on this. What about the lady when Dawn was in Tampa, Florida ministering and she just got born again? Still dressed in work clothes, so to speak, from uh, having a job that wasn't the best. She gets born again. A few minutes later, she lays hands on a blind woman and her eyes became open. She did that within the first few minutes of born again, but there's people that sit and fuse their whole entire life and step on over to heaven that have never done anything. I don't want that. I refuse to do that. What a waste of my life. I want to leave a legacy. I want to leave a legacy. See, my friends, this very same power that we are reading about in, those, in all these scriptures is the very same power that's living within us. Nothing less. This power was there the whole time of their born-again spirits. Why? Because you're one with the glorified, resurrected Christ, my friends. Smith Wigglesworth said, It is nothing less than the life of the Lord himself imparted and flowing into our whole beings so that our very body is quickened, so that every tissue and every drop of blood in our bones and joints and marrow receive this divine life. And if you look at that story of that man, that man believed that. And when you read about his life, it was like you're reading it in the book of Acts. God, that was never God's heart for us to change. God's will is never to look back in history and go, man, it's been a few years since Smith lived. He doesn't need another Smith Wigglesworth. He doesn't need another John G. Lake. They had their time. Uh, if you look in the mirror, you'll find someone staring back at you. This is your time. So will you do what you were created and made to do? See, this new creation life is filled with the power of heaven. Heaven itself came to life and to live on the inside of you in this earth. This life meant for you is meant to flow out of you. This life is to be operated in the very same way that Jesus did. Same life, same results. All of, us was made, all of this was made available because of righteousness. Righteousness put us into a new life possibilities. Righteousness is the divine life as God has it and enjoys it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. Now, if anyone is enfolded into Christ, he has become entirely a new person. All that is related to the old order has, van has vanished. Behold, everything is fresh and new. Ask yourself, what became fresh and new? That spirit of a man. And God has made all these things new and reconciled us to himself and given us the ministry of reconciliation, of reconciling others to God. In other words, it was through the anointed one that God was sheep herding. I love that. Shep shepherding and sheep herding, my friends. What does a sheep herder do? He gathers. He gathers together. One translation said that he was hugging the world to favor with himself. I like that. So he's shepherding the world, not even keeping records of their transgressions. 
and has entrusted to us the ministry of opening the door of reconciliation to God. We are ambassadors of the anointed one who carry the message of Christ to the world as though God were tenderly pleading with them directly through our lips. So we tenderly plead with you on Christ's behalf. Turn back to God and be reconciled to him. For God made the only one who did not know sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God through how? Your union with him. The moment you became in union, you became one with Jesus, everything that Jesus is is now everything that you are. The moment you said yes, God's not, that whole thing, God's working on me. When will he be done? What if the whole time you were already complete? You just didn't know it because you didn't renew your mind to it. How do I know that? Well, it's Bible. It's coming up. The real you is made just as righteous as Jesus himself. God does not live, my friends, in unrighteousness. He does live in a person that was made righteous and holy. He lives in his born-again man and woman. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. 1 John 4, 17. By living in God, love has been brought to its full expression in us so that we may fearlessly face the day of judgment. Because all that Jesus now is, now is at the right hand of God. So are we when? When we get to heaven? That's not what it says. It says, so are we right now in this world. My friends, if you'll do an inventory of your spirit, you'll find out that it's awesome and that you lack absolutely nothing. Take an inventory of who you are, and you'll find out really quick God's not going to download any more ammo, any more power, any more glory. He's not going to say, oh, man, God, I only filled that one to about 50. <laughs> he, he filled you to overflowing to the point that it gets out of your spirit, leaks out of your pores, and gets out into your clothes. Look at Jesus. Look at Peter. Look at Paul. Look at the other people that we've had ministering here in this same building. Look at the pastor. Look at Don. Look at all that. But we want to put these men in a category all by themselves. And I guarantee you, how many times have you heard from the pastor of this church, this is you too. How many times when it was time for a healing line, he just stood there and said, watch you guys do it. He's trying to get confidence built in you that you have what it takes when you're out there in the world that's rated R, not unicorns, cotton candy, and rainbow, when death's knocking at your door at somebody else's, Jesus is going to show up. Colossians chapter 1, verses 27 through 29. Living within you is the Christ. <laughs> Enough said. It's time to go home. See you guys Sunday. Living within you is the Christ who floods you with the expectation of glory. This mystery of Christ embedded within us becomes a heavenly treasure chest of hope filled with the riches of glory for his people. And God wants everyone to know it. Christ is our message. We preach to awaken hearts and bring every person into the full understanding of truth. It has become my inspiration and passion in ministry to labor with a tireless intensity with his power flowing through me to present to every believer the revelation of being his perfect one in Jesus Christ. How many more scriptures do we need, my friends? Where do you say failure? Where do you see lack? I see righteousness, perfection, completeness. <laughs> this is who God made us. If God's made you, he doesn't make failures. If God made you, he doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't need a plan B, and he doesn't need a white out, and he doesn't need a racer. He does it right the first time every time. Yep. Living within you. And within us is the Christ. His life, his nature, his ability, his faith, his love, his anointing, his power, his mercy, his grace, his righteousness, his life is flowing in us. This is the real, this is the real us. Not what we see in the mirror of glass, but what we see and what he shows us in the mirror of his word. We have been made his perfect ones just like Jesus himself. My friends, the mirror don't lie. The mirror don't lie, but what mirror are you looking into? What mirror are you looking into to find the real you? Colossians chapter 2, verses 10 through 14. And our own completeness is found in him. There you go. We are completely filled with God. 
as Christ's fullness overflows within us. He is the head of every kingdom and authority in the universe. Through our union with him, we have experienced circumcision of heart. All the guilt and the power of sin has been cut away and is now extinct because of what Christ, the anointed one, has accomplished for us. For we've been buried with him into his death, and our baptism into death also means we were raised with him when we believed in God's resurrection power, the power that raised him from death's realm. This realm of death describes our for former state, that old man that you were. For we were once held in sin's grasp, but now we've been resurrected out of that realm of death, never to return. For, your, for we are forever alive and forgiven of all of our sins, all of our sins. Even the ones you haven't committed yet, you better hope so. All of your sins, past, present, and future. He canceled out every legal violation we had on the record and the old arrest warrant that stood to indict us. He erased it all. Our sins, our stained soul, he deleted it all, and we, they could not be retrieved. Everything we once were in Adam has been placed under his cross and nailed permanently there as a public display of cancellation. My friends, the real you is glorious. The real you is powerful. The real you is a superhero. All you got to do is show up onto any scene and you got what it takes. The real you is not what you see in that mirror of glass staring back at you while you do your makeup, brush your teeth, comb your hair, get around in the mornings. The real you is found in the mirror of God's word and that man lacks nothing. He always has what it takes all the time, every time. Will you be aware of it? Will you be conscious and aware of who you are and what you possess? So when you show up on the scene, Cancer's nothing. Diabetes is nothing. A dead body just needs a jolt of God's life. Nothing. See, if not, then we're always going to view that as bigger than who God made us. Because you're looking at something in front of you with your natural eyes and letting it become bigger than who God's made you in the spirit. That's not true. I don't care what trouble you faced. I don't care what's came knocking on your door. I don't care if that situation looks like it's going to take you out and that, you, and that there's no end to it. It's just the way it is. I don't care what man has told you a doctor's report, what man has told you a legal report. I don't care. That doesn't compare to who God's made you in the spirit. Will you believe it? Will you allow the God that's working on the inside of you to take care of some business, so to speak? Will you see yourself as more than enough, or will you see that thing before you on paper or in your body bigger than who you are in the spirit? Because, my friends, remember, the mirror don't lie. But what mirror are you looking into? So here's my thing. If you need ministry, if you need healing, if you need anything going on tonight, if you'll post online, if you need anything going on online, Please post and someone will get on there and minister to you. There is no distance in the spirit, my friend. Think about it like this. Was Jesus with the centurion soldier? No. No, not physically he was not. But what did he do? He sent the word of faith. And the Bible says within that same hour, that man was healed and up and going. How is it any different? There's no distance in the spirit. So whatever you're going through in your body, whatever you're going through in your life, in the name of Jesus, I command for everything to change now in your body and everything to change now in your life and for it to line up with God's heart for your body and God's heart for your situation. That means that right now, body, you're healed in the name of Jesus. Circumstances, you're changing right now to look like heaven's best. Right now, in Jesus' name, all pain and all discomfort, leave now out of that body. Healing be in Jesus' name. I'm going to have uh, George come up and play some music. And if you need ministry in this place, listen, here's your opportunity. If you placed whatever doctor's report was, whatever the circumstances going on in your life, whatever the pain that's racking your body, whatever it is that came in your life this week and hell knocked on your door, Who's going to be the one answering? Who? Failure's not answering that door, my friends. Victory is answering that door. Jesus is answering that door. Why? Because you're the one standing there. It's Christ in you. You have what it takes. If you need any ministry, any healing, anything going on at all, you come down here and watch God move on your behalf.
healthy church is a good church. That's good. Love you guys. Friday, 6.30 to 7.30, hour of power. You come in, you pray, you see Jesus' results. We are led by the Holy Ghost. We pray for needs. We pray for things. And we get stuff done. It is an honor to be here on Friday nights. Sunday mornings, 10 a.m., come for church at the MHC, where we love the hell out of people's lives. Because there's a lot of rated R. There's a lot of hell going on in people's lives, and they're looking for answers. They thought they could find it in a pill. All it did was make things worse. They thought they could find it in an ejection or a needle. They thought they thought they could find it in sex and drugs and all this stuff that the world promises. This is it. It's going to fulfill it. But all it does is just drive them into further darkness. And what it does is it's mass. It's it's, it's a mask. Your hope is going to be found in a person in that person of Jesus. And remember that there's nothing ever too big. You know, I've heard Don say, Jesus will walk you through and go through your worst nightmare. That is so true. Because whatever you're going through, Jesus is not going to say, man, you can't. You're going to have to walk through this one by yourself. I'll be on the other side. Hopefully you'll make it through. Man, he'll walk right through that with you. And he'll bring you through the side of victory, my friends. I love you guys. I'll see you Friday and Sunday at 10 a.m. Bye-bye.